Okay, this is the third part of the lecture on the eye, 4-2. We've talked about now the retina and how it processes information. You've learned about the uh, optic pathways, how the optic nerve travels through the optic chiasm to the LGN, the uh, Baum's loop and Myers loop, which travel um, deep within the cortices to the occipital cortex, and you've learned about what each of those pathways conveys as far as the retinal field map and which part of the visual field it represents. So now let's talk about the LGN and how it processes information and then sends that information to the occipital cortex. So the LGN is in fact the target of the optic nerves. Uh, that's where that cranial nerve sends its information. The uh, lateral geniculate nucleus, part of the thalamus, when looked at under the microscope, uh, has multiple layers to it, six layers in fact. Layers one through two are, are referred to as the uh, magnocellular layer. They are responsible for processing information about movement and contrast. The other uh, four layers, three through six, are the parvocellular layers, and they process information about color, uh, and um, they are, uh, have a high degree of visual acuity, so they're separating uh, forms within <clears throat> the visual fields. Now, uh, each LGN, as you uh, got from the last video, each LGN receives information from both eyes. So the contralateral eye projects to layers one, four, and six of the LGN. So it gets one of the magnocellular layers and two of the parvocellular layers. The ipsilateral eye, the eye on the same side as the LGN we're talking about, it uh, inputs into layers two, three, and five. Again, it gets one magnocellular and two parvocellular layers. And as I mentioned before, the fovea is uh, the highest area of visual acuity and has a large representation within the optic uh, tracts and optic systems. So uh, here we now learn that about 50% of the cells within the LGN are processing information from the fovea centralis. So that's how important the fovea centralis is compared to our peripheral vision. Uh, so how do we know that these projections occur? Well, we inject a dye into one of the eyes and we watch how that dye follows, travels along the axons to uh, end up being deposited in the LGN. And so we see here, uh, that's how we get this information. So here, uh, label from the contralateral eye was added and we can see that label is deposited in layers one, four, and six. So uh, here we have that information added to our diagram about the LGN. We have the different layers of the LGN, and we have how the ipsilateral eye travels to 2, 3, and 5. And we see how the contralateral eye, the solid line, travels to layers 1, 4, and 6. Now we see that those different pathways, the magnocellular and the parvocellular pathways, uh, combined, they process that information together and send that information to the uh, visual cortex, the occipital cortex. In fact, a, a subset of the occipital cortex called the primary visual cortex. The primary visual cortex, uh, designated number 17 in Broadman's scheme of areas of the brain, which we'll learn about later, <clears throat> area 17, the primary visual cortex, is the gyri immediately surrounding the calcarine sulcus in the occipital cortex. So here when we look at this image, we can see the, uh, the primary visual cortex in uh, area 17 in the very posterior portion of the brain. On the medial view, we'll see it uh, outlines either side of the calcarine sulcus. We have other areas of the occipital cortex that are processing visual information as well. These are um, the secondary visual processing as well as the associative areas where we're taking information from our other cognitive processes and combining that 
with our visual information to associate that information. So here in this picture, just real quickly, this is a complex picture you don't need to understand, but it does have the medial view, the mid-sagittal view where you can see in yellow the V1 area, the primary visual cortex, then in orange the, um, the secondary visual cortex, and then in um, blues and greens we have the association cortices. So again, talking about the mid-sagittal view of the brain, the calcarine sulcus divides the occipital cortex into the cuneus and the lingua. And so we have those different uh, regions. The cuneus is responsible for the inferior uh, visual field. So as we're looking out of our vision, everything below uh, the midline of our vision, that is the inferior visual field. It is being transmitted up to the cuneus. And uh, conversely, the lingua is getting everything from the upper visual field. <clears throat> so the LGN is getting this information about contrasting color, movement, and forms, combining it together, and sending it to the input layer of uh, of the occipital cortex. So the input layer of the cortex is always layer four, if you'll recall. So we have uh, input cells in layer four of the cortex, and those input cells are getting information from the parvocellular pathway and the magnocellular pathway. Those layer four neurons uh, then uh, send that information out to the pyramidal cells located in layers two and layer five. So these are output cells of the occipital cortex. These uh, layer five uh, output pyramidal neurons are sending information out of the cortex to a different region of the brain. So just like the upper motor neuron in layer five of the primary motor cortex is outputting below the cortex to the spinal cord, these layer five occipital uh, neur pyramidal neurons are sending visual information out of the cortex. And so they are sending it to the uh, superior colliculus, which is responsible for directing our gaze in relation to information uh, in our visual field. So it, the superior colliculus helps us uh, uh, if something is coming into our peripheral vision fast, our eyes automatically move to it. Uh, that is the superior colliculus moving our extra uh, ocular muscles to direct our gaze at that object, something that our eyes focus on. So that's an example of an extra cortical pathway. Now, layer two neurons are what are called as association neurons. And they send that information to other cortical areas. For that information to be associated with other information that we're receiving or that we understand from our memories. So the V1, the primary visual cortex, is sending this information to uh, the secondary and the tertiary, the association fields. So still we're staying within the primary cortex, V1, around the uh, calcarine sulcus. Each one millimeter cubed region of the primary visual cortex has all it needs to process every aspect of the visual information we're getting from one pixel, one small area of our visual field, of our retinal fields. So the LGN is sending information about color, movement, uh, sound, uh, not <laughs> uh, movement, contrast, motion, that, the, all of those things to uh, specific one millimeter cubed portions of that cortical uh, occipital cortex, the primary cortex, and it's sending that information into layer four. And so there are different columns within the, um, the, uh, this one millimeter cubed region. And these different columns process information about different orientations of lines. These are called orientation columns.
there are layer they are um, what are called blobs. Each one millimeter cubed area has four different blobs that are processing the different information from the different opsins in our eyes. And so these are classifying the colors within that small visual field. <clears throat> there are what are called ocular dominance columns that run lengthwise this direction that process information from the contralateral versus ipsilateral uh, eyes. So we have a stereoscopic understanding within V1 about information in this visual field. So we can say within this most fundamental cortical layer or, or cortical area that there is the, the depth, the distance of an object, that sort of thing. <clears throat> so each one of these one millimeter cubed areas processes the orientation of lines, the color of the lines, movement, as well as the uh, left versus right eye differences in that visual field. So it's fully categorizing this information and then these layer two neurons are sending that information out to different portions of the brain. And so this is called the visual streams hypothesis about how the uh, brain uh, is, is associating information uh, in the different regions. Uh, so the occipital cortex has processed all this information and it's associating it up into the parietal cortex. And the parietal cortex is telling us uh, things like where the object is in our visual space or how that object is related to other objects in our visual space. Then there's a, uh, so that's the dorsal stream to the parietal cortex. There's a ventral stream to the temporal cortex and the temporal cortex is getting that visual information and associating that visual information with things about the identity of things in our visual field. So when we look at a marker, we see that it's a collection of lines and, and shapes at different angles and colors. And then our temporal cortex tells us that that is a blue marker. Without that pathway to the, visual, to the temporal cortex, we wouldn't be able to name this thing that we can see uh, in our visual field. We could reproduce it, we could draw it, but we wouldn't be able to name it because the temporal cortex is telling us what the object is and what purpose the object has. So throughout our cortex, there are association regions and they play various different roles. The fusiform gyrus that we see on this slide is responsible for identifying and classifying familiar objects. So the left fusiform gyrus will see an object and it'll say, oh, that's an apple, or oh, that's something else. It's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a marker or something, or it's something I've seen many times before. Or it will see it and it'll say, that's a face. It'll classify a, a collection of lines of different orientation and colors as a face. And then it'll send that information to the right fusiform gyrus, and the right fusiform gyrus has information about which faces we're seeing at a given time. So it'll say, that is Masha's face, or that is Dr. Sani's face. And so there are people that have deficits in this pathway or within the right fusiform gyrus. And they have an inability to recognize faces. In fact, about 10% of the population has trouble with their fusiform gyrus and has a degree of deficit in identifying and recognizing people's faces. So, you know, you have a friend from back in the day or whatever, and you're walking on the street and you see them and you're like, hey, hey, how are you doing? It's been so long. And they're like, I'm sorry, who are you? And it's not because they're a jerk. It's because their fusiform gyrus is probably one of the 10% that's not processing information as well as, you know, somebody on the other end of the spectrum. So, um, you know, that condition is called prosopagnosia, the inability to recognize faces. <clears throat>
So that is, is uh, that the processing of faces occurs in the right fusiform gyrus. <clears throat> so uh, moving on, there are other regions of the cortex where we can have lesions, uh, which will result in different problems. So we've already talked about lesions to the occipital cortex uh, <clears throat> from the... Um, uh, uh, the MCA and the PCA and the macular sparing and the overlap there. But uh, if there is damage, maybe like a TBI or whatever, to the uh, primary visual cortex, then you're not getting that visual information into your conscious thought processes because it's not, uh, because all of that fundamental processing that goes on in V1 is not happening. So this is a condition called cortical blindness, where the eye is working just fine, the optic nerves and tracts and everything, the LGN's great, but the cortex is damaged. And so these individuals have cortical blindness. <clears throat> um, so in relation to that, the optic pathways are actually sending information. There are collaterals. So although someone may have cortical blindness, there is still some visual processing that occurs. So the, um, the, uh, there are collaterals that send information directly to the superior colliculus without undergoing visual processing first. And there's collaterals that send information to the pulvinar of the thalamus and then up to the parietal cortex. And so uh, this information allows a, blind, a cortically blind individual to be able to perform some feats that you would think are, are not possible. Their eyes can, can potentially automatically orient to a light source. You flick a switch and the light turns on, their eyes might flip up to the light uh, as they're, you know, um, not looking at anything. Their eyes will... Uh, automatically direct themselves to a light because the superior colliculus is still intact and still sending information about where light's happening. Or something might fly into their visual field and they don't even know, but their eyes are moving toward something that has moved into their visual field because of the superior colliculus. If a cortically blind patient, you can test this, you can have a cortically blind patient, like in your exam room and whatever, hold your pen light up to their eyes and ask them, Hey, where do you, I'm, I'm holding a light into your eyes. Can you point to where that light's coming from? And they'll be like, Doc, you're a fucking asshole. I'm blind, you idiot. And then you're like, no, 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 really. Um, I want to test your non-conscious visual pathways. Just take a guess uh, where the light's coming from that I'm shining in your eyes. And they'll be like, I, you're such a jerk. Whatever, it's over there. And remarkably, they'll they'll get it pretty right in the in the general direction. So, um, you know that's that's blind sight because there are processes that bypass V1, the the primary visual cortex. <clears throat> now, moving on to the parietal cortex, it's giving us information about where an object is. So, uh, people with damage to the posterior parietal cortex. You can show them something in their visual field and you'll ask them, what am I holding? Or what's right here in front of you or whatever. And they'll be able to say, oh, that's a blue marker. And then you'll say, okay, can you take it from my hand? And they'll be like, oh, I have no idea where it is. They won't be able to reach for it and grab it. That's because their parietal cortex is not telling them where the object is in their visual field. So their parietal cortex can't tell their primary uh, motor cortex and their frontal cortex where to reach for. So they can't coordinate their actions to point to or grab an object in their visual field, but they can tell you with complete fidelity what is in their visual field. Uh, kind of conversely, occipitotemporal cortex is the what problem. So these patients won't be able to tell you what an object is. Uh, they can see a blue marker in their visual field. Uh, they can perfectly draw and color and reproduce the blue marker in their visual field. But you ask them to name 
that thing that they just drew and they'll be like, hell if I know. Uh, I, I've, I've never heard that thing called anything before. I don't know what it is. Because they're not associating what they see with a name, with an object, with a purpose uh, for that object. Uh, so there are different degrees to this condition. That's called associative agnosia. Uh, there is also a perceptive agnosia where um, they can name an object, but they won't be able to reproduce it. And so that's depending upon where in the temporal cortex these pathways are impaired. And so uh, I already described cortical blindness, but here uh, we are seeing uh, the, the description of that. We can see the pathways where there are collaterals before getting to the LGN, collaterals to the superior colliculus, and that's projecting information to the thalamus and ultimately to the cortex. And so um, because of this um, branching off, we, the, the cortically blind people will also exhibit uh, the ability to focus on an object in their visual field, accommodation. And they'll also, depending on the degree of their deficits, will also be able to, uh, their eyes will dilate and contract in response to light. Because those are uh, automatic and autonomic processes that are occurring before visual processing takes place. Uh, so, uh, interesting little tidbits of clinical relevance there, uh, but that's all I have, so thanks for listening.